Well, welcome back, everyone, to Financial Foreplay Podcast. I've taken a, an extended period off over Christmas just to have a really good break and come back feeling rejuvenated and fantastic. And what better way to start off the new year with a podcast talking about property? Now, there's, you know, I think our guest today is going to tell you some great stats and stuff, but I just want to frame it up by saying this. You know, so many people come to me and they talk about, you know, how do we build wealth for our families? How do we get ahead? How do we make sure that we have that nest egg at the end? And savings alone is not going to get you there. You know, interest rates being lowest that they've been in decades, you have to look at other um, forms of getting your money to work for you, talking about things like compound interest and buying things that appreciate over time, perhaps even some of these things pay you investment income or dividends or some other stream. So, you know, savings at 0.25% is not going to really amount to much. And so it's really interesting talking about property because I read an article just yesterday, I believe it was in the age where they were saying that in Melbourne alone, the median property property prices have jumped in the last year. So 12 months, from $860,000 to over $1 million. That is unfathomable growth in one single market of property over the last year. But, you know, a lot of people are asking the question, you know, how do we get in? You know, how are people, you know, getting a foothold in the market? Are they able to buy their own first home? Are they able to even fathom or think about having an investment property? And how would they go about doing it? So, That's why I'm really excited to have Mikhail on the program today. You know, he started off in engineering. So the person that you're going to be hearing from today is very smart from a mathematical perspective because he comes from that, you know, pure engineering background. But he also has his master's in international finance from HEC in Paris. You're going to hear the beautiful French French accent as well when when he comes on in and chats with you. He began his career as an M&A investment banker for UBS in London. He's traveled around the world, you know, before doing what he's doing right now. He was an associate partner at McKinsey and Company. He was leading the data and artificial intelligence practice, serving clients across telco, media, tech, private equity, and financial services industry. So he's got a really broad understanding of not just the technology between how do you forecast and predict but also a good experience across many different uh, industry backgrounds. He's the founder and co-CEO of Prop Hero. And just to put this in context, that's a data-driven digital platform right here in Australia for property investments. They help you find, buy, and even manage the best investment properties, because it's not just about buying something. It's about buying something that's going to be good for you now, good for you and your family and your future. So please um, join me in welcoming Mikhail to the uh, podcast now. Thanks for being here. Thanks for welcoming me. Really appreciate it. Hey, I'm going to jump right into it because I have so many questions that I want to ask you. But first and foremost, so you guys special, obviously, in investment properties. Is there a specific reason for that? That's absolutely right. So the our mindset is that we want we really want to modernize the real estate industry through data and digital. And um, for property investment, we see it as just like any type of investment, and we rely on data and advanced analytics to find the best investments across the entire country. The reason why we don't go for owner occupiers is that when it's your own home where you want to live. Uh, there is an emotional aspect to it, right? And emotional aspects don't really go uh, well with data. And so what we said is that, well, we only focus on property investments. We'd find uh, the most promising uh, uh, investment properties across the country. uh, And we rely on data and analysis, and we just put the emotion out of the equation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? In, In terms of market size, I mean, how many Australians right now would actually have an investment property? So look, there are like there are like different stats on the on the topic. Uh, what I've seen is that be, between ten and twenty percent uh, uh, have an investment uh, property. Uh, a vast majority of them have only one. The reason being that it's sometimes not the right one, and so either they have like negative cash flows or just like not the right growth to allow for to allow for uh, for the next one. Uh, interestingly, uh, I would say two things. One is that 
almost 100% of our clients tell us that they want to build a portfolio, right? So like I've never, I think I've never had a client telling me I only want to buy one, right? Because with only one, you cannot <laughs> achieve your, your long-term objectives. The second thing that I think is really interesting is that uh, I saw the stats that about 50% of people below 40 who buy a property buy it as an investment. So they are what, they are what we call rent investors. And the reason you, you, you just mentioned it before, right? Prices went up so much, especially in capital cities, that most people now can't really afford to buy a house to live in, but still want to get into the property market. And that's why they become rent investors. And that's just a fundamental shift that we're seeing all around the globe, especially in Australia. Yeah, and that's fascinating, isn't it? That people, you know, you're, you're able to actually help them to access that monumental growth through buying something, but they're living in probably, they're actually choosing to live in the suburb that they want to live in and renting in that suburb. But, you know, I mean, like, uh, in a very uh, simplified view, uh, the probability that where you live is in the top 1% of areas to invest in is only 1%, right? So yeah. I think the, the previous uh, idea of like buying a house to live in, if you take out the emotional aspects, just like with like very simple math, it's very unlikely to be the best investment possible, right? And I think that's what we're seeing now more and more people. They see properties just as an investment not as, as as an emotion. And anyway, because they travel, because they know they want to live abroad at some point, like just having a house for the next 30 years is not what, what is not really what's relevant for them. So just, yeah, like a completely, a complete change in the market. So right now, where are you seeing the biggest opportunities? Is it in the big cities? Is it in the rural areas? Where, where are you seeing mathematically are the best places to buy? <laughs> so um, just a little context before. So we track, all of the 18,000 or so suburbs across Australia, and we, do, we, we actually do this in, in different countries. Um, in Australia, uh, what you have to understand is uh, that when you think about properties, there is what may happen in the very short term and what are like the more longer term fundamental trends, right? Uh, when you look at the data, what, uh, what's driving prices in the long term in a given area is actually the macroeconomics. Right, uh, where we are seeing uh, the most uh, attractive long-term macroeconomics is in the top two or three big cities, uh, and also in some very specific, attractive uh, um, uh, regional areas that can attract uh, more affluent populations. What this being said, what we are seeing now, and when when we look at the trends in the data, it feels like in well, especially in Sydney, in Melbourne. Like, if you look at the full investment view, it's really hard to have uh, positive cash flows, right? So, uh, and so for many investors, unless they have actually like a high salary, investing today in Sydney or Melbourne will could prevent them from buying more in one or two or three years, right? So where we are seeing uh, the biggest opportunities now is like in other in cities, other in big cities, other than Sydney and, and Melbourne where the economy is strong uh, and where the economy should be strong in the long term and where uh, we believe that there is a possibility to attract more affluent people in the long term. So that's where, where we are focusing uh, on now. Uh, yeah, and well, and so far, yeah, we've just had like very, very good results. So typically when people come to you and they want to, you know, buy that first property or maybe they already have one and they want you to help them get the second one, do they have an idea in their mind of where they want to buy and are they mentally constrained by thinking that it has to be in the city where they live so that they can manage it afterwards? So most of our clients just just trust us on, on this one, right? And the reason is pretty simple. Uh, where we buy today is not at all where we were buying six months ago. Right, and the reason is simple. <laughs> when you're right, uh, prices go up to a point where it just doesn't make sense to uh, invest there anymore. So you have to look for for for, for, for the the next hotspots, right? And so we constantly move areas, right? So and that's why we are, we are tracking the entire country. Uh, so we are like uh, location agnostic, I would say. Uh, so yeah, like people typically tell us that uh, they just like trust us on the location, but of course they trust us uh, because we show them the data, the analysis, and the output of our data models and it just like helps them make this uh, experience just like super transparent which they would not have otherwise 
How do you separate? So when you're assessing a property for someone, how do you separate what they might get in capital appreciation over time versus what the physical economics look like from a profit and loss perspective of the rent and the interest and all that stuff on the property? How do you keep those two things separate? Yeah. So I think it's important to uh, debunk a myth here. You know, like many people think that data and AI will replace humans and uh, it will be the, the apocalypse. In reality, and having worked in data and AI across yeah, like over like 10 industries on five continents, um, the best results that we're having is when you pair data and AI with human expertise. That's just like the best outcome. And I'd say that for us, the uh, data and AI does about like the first 80 to 90% of the job, but the last 10 or 20% is actually done by human experts, right? And so that's the combination of the two that uh, gives the best results. And to your question, uh, so we, of course, share with our clients uh, all the uh, uh, outputs from the data model explaining like why we believe in long-term growth for a given uh, area or for and for a given type of property. And then we have like local experts who can just confirm the economics and who will check like all your uh, well, both uh, uh, income and also expenses, and so we do this like very precisely, with the mindset that we we always want our our clients to have good surprises. So we always, on purpose, um, underestimate the rental income and overestimate cost. Again, just for the mindset of having uh, uh, only good surprises for for our clients. But they, they, I think there will always be a human component to it. And I mean, again, I've worked on this on like in so many industries. I think we are at least 10 or 15 years away from having the machine taking over completely. Yeah, fair enough. And when you're helping people to identify and you're trying to figure out, you know, what they should buy and where they should buy, how do you help them control how much they're going to pay? Because when they, you know, if there's auctions, there's all these other sort of human elements where they're going to rock up and a hundred people are going to be there bidding against them for this property. How do you help them to manage that? So, I mean, we do we, we run the entire process end to end, right? So they, they don't have to go through uh, through this stress. I think it's twofold. So one, what you realize when you look actually at the facts is for uh, in any given suburbs, there are amazing deals being made and very bad deals being made. And like in every single market, like all the time. And so it's just about like being like uh, very much like data driven to understand for each property where we will make an offer, what is the maximum price that makes it a top 5% best deal in the area, right? And so, and our mindset is that we just like uh, agree with our clients on the maximum price to make a great deal. Uh, If someone bets more, that's absolutely fine. We just move on up until we get the the right deal. I know, so it actually takes us like many uh, attempts for a given client to get the deal, but that's the price to pay in order uh, to have the best ones. Now, that's like the first element. Second element is of course of markets. I think that now maybe like about 50% of our deals uh, are off market. Um, and you know, like, well, it's just about like having locally uh, someone who has the connections to find the great deals. Um, and of course, you know, like for sellers agents, they know that through us, they have like reliable buyers uh, because I mean, uh, uh, we, we just like uh, make the process happen. And also we have like clients that who already have a pre-approval. So it just, it's just like a win-win relationship. Uh, so yes, that's how we, we do it at the moment. But I'd say, yeah, like today, if you want to invest in property alone, it's really hard to secure a very good deal for yourself if, if you don't have these connections. It's very hard. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and that's the, the biggest, I guess, issue is that if people are waiting till everyone on the block shows up to go to these auctions, they're exactly. probably not going to get a good deal. Yeah, exactly right. And so and I, I can give you another stat. We do the 0% of our deals at auction, 0%. <laughs> so it's very clear. <laughs> Yeah, because the emotions, right? People's emotions get exactly, and uh, and uh, emotions are. I mean, okay, it's it's an investment. You should have emotions in an investment. That's very simple. Do you have a, a sense of what the stats might be around on um, when people are buying these properties through you? How many of them are investing quite heavily in upgrades and things to get the property ready for rent or? Yeah, so I mean, it's part of uh, of our uh, offering, right? So in the idea of like making the entire investment journey simple. When we uh, help a client buy your property, so not only do we help on the process, we also uh, advise them on their options for renovations. Um, I'd say that about 
35% of clients actually do what we call a light reno, uh, which in many cases is the best way to optimize your yield in the short term. Um, and then just like for like uh, obvious cash reasons, only a tiny minority of clients go, uh, they, they want to go for like uh, something bigger, like uh, like uh, uh, adding a granny flat or adding a, a fourth bedroom. Um, it also depends on like uh, how, uh, I mean, how they could get uh, this cash for the renovations. But yeah, I would say like one third do like what we call like a light reno. And like, it's actually like very much like uh, market dependent. And we've got like data on that, but you have for each area, specific improvements that allow you to maximize your yield. So for example, I'm, so, uh, I'm in Brisbane today um, and in uh, several or many suburbs in Brisbane, a very good way to optimize your, your yield is to put a shed in the garden, right? <laughs> That's actually, so it sounds like very, uh, very basic, but actually when you look at how much it costs to put and how much rent uh, increase you can get, uh, that's actually a very good deal. Similarly, uh, you know, like there are like a, a few things depending on the area where it's actually a good thing to do. But again, you know, like, I mean, I don't want to be too, uh, generic here because uh, it could be misleading, right? It really depends on the area and it's about like understanding data that supports this. Fair enough. And so if you're helping people get into the market and maybe they're buying one property, maybe more than one, how are you helping them to manage the investments? Because that is also a huge headache, isn't it? Absolutely. And uh, well, let's be honest. Uh, if you have a uh, not very good property manager, your investment journey can become an absolute nightmare, like 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 an absolute nightmare. And so, you know, like, so I was saying, you know, we track the entire uh, uh, country and we are location agnostic. And so whenever our data tells us that uh, a new area is like the new hotspot, so we uh, set up operation in this area. And typically what we, what we would do is that we would interview many, many, many uh, property managers in the area in order to find the best partner there. So like very often, we don't do the property management ourselves, but we we will uh, connect you with just the most uh, trustworthy and competent and uh, and passionate uh, property manager, which will, again, uh, remove this headache. And of course, over time, we track the satisfaction of our clients to make sure that they have a great experience with our property managers. Yeah, fair enough. What's the typical LVR on these investment properties? Are people having to come up with 10, 20% down? Yeah, so... I'd say that it's maybe like 50-50 between 20 and 10 percent um, uh, uh, deposit that they are putting. Um, that's what we see most of the time. Um, maybe recently we've had more uh, uh, of like the the 10 percent deposits, uh, but now of course it's. Uh, I mean, in these cases, there is like even greater responsibility on our shoulders, right? Because it means that these clients typically have like less cash available uh, and are obviously more, um, uh, they could be more impacted if rates uh, were increasing. And again, so when we share, uh, so we have like live tools that they can use to um, to, to make simulations around their cash flows. Uh, we try to be like very conservative, especially on the interest rate, just to be sure, yeah, that they have like some leeway should, should the rates uh, increase. Are you seeing, like, are you working closely with brokers to help people also, or do you leave that on their shoulders to find the right banking or brokers? Yeah, and also, I mean, for every single step of the investment journey, so we have partnerships if our clients need them. So yeah, we, we work with several, like, very good uh, brokers. And I think, you know, like, um, from, from my experience, it's not only about finding the best rate or the best bank, it's also someone who will help make things happen if something wrong happens, you know, uh, we've had cases, you know, like, I mean, it happens so often, you know, like uh, uh, the finance date happen, uh, is in two days. Uh, one document is missing for, uh, at the bank. And so we have to push back on the on the finance date. Uh, having a great broker who's so dedicated and who, who will move mountains for you can really help. So, yeah, like uh, I'd say, you know, like, I mean, again, like, uh, so, we, and by the way, we don't get any commission from them, right? So we just have uh, these partnerships because it's great for our clients, but we don't get any commission there. So I just say, be careful, choose your, your broker well, because especially in this market where banks are tightening some of their rules, it can really help just make the deal happen. Yeah, fair enough. So look, I think this is such a fantastic and interesting idea. I mean, it's a way to really get people into the market where maybe they can't afford their own house, but they could afford to buy something as an investment property and they're building equity that way. You know, it's just and you're managing so much of the process, which I find really, you know, huge respect and admiration to you guys for taking kind of like all that 
crappy stuff out of (laughs) stress, the lack of transparency, the, you know, hundreds of hours that people would have to spend. Like most people are not going to have the mathematical nous or the macroeconomic overview to choose wisely by themselves. You know, but, taking that away. But, but you know what? I mean, that's why we, we, we launched Pop Hero, right? You know, like, so uh, I was a property investor myself uh, at the time, you know, so I had a job at McKinsey. I was like super busy. I had savings, but I had like, uh, but I had like no time. And so I hired a buyer's agent uh, to help me. In the end, I paid her so much and I was feeling that most of it was uh, based on guts feeling and being myself very much data driven and focusing on technology, building all these amazing things for my uh, banking, telco, uh, insurance clients, etc. I was thinking, wow, uh, we have to change real estate, right? It's just like not good for the people. And actually, I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but uh, there was this study recently by the MIT, so Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the US, that ranked the industries in terms of digital and data maturity. And real estate ranked 21st out of 23, right? So the industry is just like not mature yet. And the consequence is that everyday people, yeah, just don't have access to the right insights and to the right amazing experience as what they could see for any other type of service. Fair enough. So if people want to reach out and get in touch with you, they want to, you know, can you tell us a little bit about how you onboard people, how much, you know, they'll be paying. Is it a monthly thing? Like how do, how do you make money from this and how do you get yeah. customers? So, I mean, it always starts with like a strategy session, right? So uh, even though we're a tech company, as I, was, as I was mentioning before, like there's a human component that is critical to understand our clients and their needs uh, and also explain them how we work. And so, and uh, following this session, we have like very honest conversations, you know, like sometimes we tell clients, look, what you're looking to get uh, we don't believe it's the right strategy. And so we prefer not working with you rather than uh, buying something that we think is not the, 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 the best investment. You know, so some, sometimes people tell us, I want to buy there this type of property for this amount. We say, look, I'm, we're sorry, but like, we don't believe in this investment. And so we prefer just like not taking your money and just like not do it. If the call uh, goes well, and if we believe, uh, if both sides believe that we can uh, bring value to each other, so the way we work that we, so we charge an engagement fee of $990. That's just to start working together. And then we uh, start the hunt for a property, right? Uh, We do everything really end-to-end, like really, really end-to-end. When the property is yours, uh, we charge, and only then, we charge a success fee of $9,000. So that's like $10,000 in total. Uh, So that's how we make uh, money. And I really want to say that this covers everything, right? So we do the inspection. So we have like inspectors in every hotspot around the country. Uh, We do all the due diligence. We do like all the math. We share all these insights. So that's that's how we work. Um, And uh, and yeah, and so, well, I think well, so far it's going pretty well, right? So uh, another stat that we have is that uh, within six months of their first investment with us, over 30% of our clients buy the second property, right? So, uh, wow. so yeah, I think it's a good sign that yeah, like they are like uh, pretty convinced about uh, how we do things. Yeah, fair enough. Well, look, I hope that lots of people will reach out to you because I think this is a really, really solid way of people stepping onto that Thank ladder. You. And presuming, presumably, you've got you know houses at different levels as well. So people may come to you and say, you know, only have 50,000 to invest or somebody else might say, well, I've got 200,000 to invest. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like I think like the, the, um, I think, yeah, like that's good. Yeah. Some people come to us and they have like, I think the minimum would be like about 50 to $60,000 in savings. Uh, below that, you know, actually we had the case recently, one one potential client who had like 40,000 and we told him, look, for your budget, we don't think we can find you uh, a, an amazing deal. So we said, look, just wait a little bit, but yeah, we, we just don't want to bring you into this because we are not confident we will get there. But if you have at least uh, $50,000 in savings, that's uh, that's absolutely fine. Uh, and then, of course, yeah, we've got parents who have like uh, much, much more and who sometimes even buy like several properties uh, in parallel with us. I'm going to make sure that I gather all of your details together and put them in the show notes. So I'll leave um, everyone uh, a specific URL so they can find your website, they can reach out. Is LinkedIn, email, how do you want to be contacted? Look, I think the yeah. easiest is info at prophero.com.au. Otherwise, LinkedIn, Facebook, anything. If you want to contact me directly, so watch out for the spelling. It's Michael. 
M I C K A E L at prophero.com.au. I'll be and you know, like and even if you're not sure about investing, we love property, we love investments. We're just like very happy to chat all the time. Wonderful. Well, look, I hope you get lots of business out of this. I think it's a great, great idea. Thanks, Romalin. Really appreciate it. Pleasure.